Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is Mark Sampson, your host today of the uh, next installment of the RPTS webinar series. And our guest today is uh, Dr. Dennis Perteau. And we're on the third floor here of the seminary building. And uh, if I understand correctly, about 10 years ago, this was Dr. Perteau's living quarters. So uh, he gets to relive some of that as he takes us through an interesting webinar today. And uh, without any further delay, I'm going to turn this over and uh, we'll let him go. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, our subject is uh, the genius of psalmody, the subjective element. And uh, we'll be explaining that as we uh, proceed. But uh, to get started, I want to uh, read from uh, Psalm 130 and uh, have a word of prayer. So, Psalm 130. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities... O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits for the Lord. And in his word I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, your grace, for your word, for your goodness, and for the uh, redemption that you give us from all of our iniquities. And uh, as we uh, take the words of uh, this particular psalm upon our lips and upon our hearts, we uh, thank you that you enable us to do so. And we thank you that you enable us to utilize these words to call out to you. And so uh, as we are together for a short time now, uh, be pleased to bless and strengthen us and open our hearts that we might uh, discern uh, the greatness, uh, the goodness, and the uh, element of uh, this subjectiveness that we will be talking about in uh, the Psalter. So uh, bless us and strengthen us now, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Again, our title is uh, the uh, subjective element in the Psalms, and we're glad that uh, RP Missions is uh, again uh, sponsoring the webinar, and uh, when you have an opportunity, you can uh, thank them personally. We'd appreciate it if you'd be uh, willing to do that. And uh, uh, just an introductory slide here, and uh, reminding us of our uh, subject matter, the subjective element of the Psalms or of the Psalter. Uh, here are the... Um, uh, uh, primary references I'm using, and uh, you'll see these again at the end of the uh, webinar, uh, but I thought it might be helpful for you to uh, see uh, uh, what these titles are. The first is uh, Athanasius's letter uh, to Marcellinus concerning the Psalms, and uh, you, you can see there you can get it in book form uh, from Paulus Press. You can also go to uh, fisheaters.com and uh, search Athanasius, and you'll uh, uh, get that letter. And actually, I think the translation there uh, is a little better than in uh, the book. Then, of course, uh, Calvin's uh, preface to his commentary on the Book of Psalms. Quite helpful, and uh, if you haven't read it, uh, you, you certainly need to do so. Uh, Michael Lefebvre's uh, recent book, Sing the Songs of Jesus, uh, this is quite a helpful little book, and uh, you'll see the quotes that I have from uh, Lefebvre. And then uh, two uh, references uh, for Voss. 
uh, at the end of the uh, Pauline Eschatology is an essay on the eschatology of the Psalter, uh, which is very helpful. And uh, so if you have the uh, Pauline Eschatology at the end of that book, you'll find uh, Voss's uh, essay. And then uh, his sermon entitled Songs from the Soul, which is in uh, Grace and Glory. Uh, and uh, it's in an earlier uh, edition than the uh, current paperback form that's uh, circulating, at least circulating around the seminary now. Uh, this is a, a, out of a hardback copy printed by uh, Banner of Truth, and uh, you can uh, look this up on the web. I think you'll uh, find it, and if you're interested in it, you could uh, uh, download it. Uh, very helpful, uh, uh, the web is, in uh, finding some of these books. Uh, we begin uh, this afternoon with Colossians 3.16, and I'm purposely... Uh, using the English Standard Version because I think it uh, helps us uh, understand the text uh, best. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And uh, there's the subjective element uh, as Paul uh, gives it to us. The word of Christ, uh, which in the end would be Christ himself dwelling in us. And uh, uh, of course, one of Paul's uh, favorite adverbs, richly. Uh, you find this quite often in Romans. Uh, how do we uh, let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly? Uh, Paul gives us two ways that this is done. First, uh, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. And uh, what Paul means here is by sitting under the preaching of the Word. Uh, Paul uses almost the same language in Colossians 1.28 uh, when he says, We proclaim him, that is Christ, teaching and admonishing uh, one another with all wisdom. Uh, almost the identical language. And so uh, teaching and admonishing here refers to uh, proclamation. And then uh, the second uh, vehicle or the second means uh, by which we uh, let the word of Christ dwell in us richly is through our singing. And, uh, of course, the uh, position we take here at the seminary and in uh, the RP Church is that psalms, uh, hymns, and spiritual songs refer to the psalms. And uh, so we're talking about singing uh, the psalms. And uh, uh, the uh, subjective element comes out then in uh, this singing, and uh, of course I'm particularly interested in this as we uh, talk about the uh, subjective element uh, in the Psalms or in the Psalter. Uh, so what is this uh, subjective element? Uh, putting it quite simply, uh, this is how uh, I characterize it. Uh, the Psalter is a divine guide for expressing our thoughts, feelings, and emotions to God. In other words, uh, as we've already read in Psalm uh, uh, 130, we uh, cry out uh, to the Lord, and uh, we utilize the uh, very words of uh, the psalm. Uh, out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. We take uh, the words of the psalm on our own lips and express our own thoughts feelings, and emotions uh, to God. And uh, this, is, this is the, the genius, I think, of the Psalter. This is the genius of, of psalmody. This is the genius uh, of the Psalms. Uh, and uh, if we're going to uh, properly grasp this subjective element, it seems to me that we have to reorient our thinking a little bit. Uh, maybe not uh, simply a little bit, but quite a bit. Uh, as uh, I have here from uh, Lefebvre, uh, we rightly read 65 books of the Bible as God's word to us. Uh, but Lefebvre uh, uh, tells us, but the psalm book is different. Uh, it, it, let's see, but the psalm book is different. It alone is composed as a collection of songs from men to God. Uh, they are no less God's inspired word. The Psalms are, are still God's inspired word. We look at the Psalms 
as God's Word, God's Word given to us, uh, God's Word breathed out and uh, given to us, and we may study uh, the Psalms in this way. Uh, But uh, the Psalms are given to us for a little bit different uh, reason than just our study of them. Uh, They are given to us to be songs from us to God. Uh, In the Psalms, we receive an exceptional gift designed to become our words to God. Uh, In other words, what Lefebvre is uh, saying to us is that we uh, are given the privilege of uh, taking these words on our own lips and uh, singing these words uh, to God. Uh, As he goes on, Uh, The Psalms are words for God's people to sing to him. This does not mean the Psalms are any less God's word to us than other books of the Bible. And uh, uh, as I was reflecting on this uh, and uh, thinking about uh, reading commentaries on the Psalms and studying the Psalms, we often uh, study them as uh, God's word to us, like the rest of Scripture the Psalms are fully God's word to us. But, uh, as Lefebvre uh, observes, but unlike the rest of Scripture, the Psalms are further designed, uh, you see, this is the extra element, uh, further designed to become our words to sing back to God. And uh, this is how we need to reorient our thinking. Uh, Even those of us who regularly take up uh, the Psalm books Uh, in our hands and uh, sing to God, uh, we need to reorient our thinking as uh, uh, we sing that these words are now our words that we uh, sing back to God. Uh, uh, Gerhardus Voss alerts us to this important aspect of the Psalter. And uh, as you read Voss, I think you realize this is the case. And of course, this comes out in Uh, other places also. As God's word, we sing back to him. The Psalms, says Voss, are distinguished by a penetrating subjectiveness. And uh, in another place in his eschatology of the Psalter, he uh, speaks about the subjective element. And uh, of course, this is what he's uh, speaking about here. And uh, the Psalms do have a penetrating uh, subjectiveness as uh, we look at them. Uh, How should we understand this? Well, uh, Voss helps us here once again. Uh, The deeper fundamental character of the Psalter consists in this, that it voices the subjective response to the objective doings of God for and among his people. And so on one hand, we have what God does, who he is, how he acts, how he reveals himself. And uh, on the other hand, we have our subjective response to God, uh, our joy in seeing who he is, our sorrow for our sins, because we understand his perfections. And uh, Voss goes on to say then, subjective responsiveness is the specific quality of these songs. And uh, it seems to me this is what we need to pick up. This is uh, what we need to grasp. This is uh, the aspect of the Psalter that we uh, very much need uh, not only to understand but to live As prophecy is objective, uh, says Voss, being the address of Jehovah to Israel in word and act, so the Psalter is subjective. It's the response. Subjective being the answer of Israel to divine speech. Uh, So we have these two sides. uh, The objective works of God and our subjective response And uh, understanding the subjective element, we uh, should understand that uh, the Psalter uh, has this uh, penetrating subjectiveness, as uh, Voss puts it, in guiding us in the response that we are to make to God. 
Uh, Calvin uh, puts it this way, and uh, this, of course, comes from his preface uh, to uh, the Psalms. And uh, you're probably familiar with this, uh, at least part of this quote. Uh, Calvin says, I have been accustomed to call this book, that is, the book of Psalms or the Psalter, I think not inappropriately an anatomy of all the parts of the soul. Uh, so that if you were to uh, take a course in anatomy uh, in a medical school, you would learn about all the uh, parts of the body, and uh, you'd get to uh, uh, d- do some uh, delving into uh, dead bodies and look at all the uh, parts of uh, uh, the body. But here now, uh, Calvin is saying that the book of the Psalms, the Psalter, opens up for us the soul uh, so that we can understand the soul. For there is not an emotion of which anyone can be conscious that is not here represented as in a mirror. All the emotions uh, that we could uh, conceive of are uh, discussed properly and set forth properly in the book of Psalms. Or rather, Calvin goes on, the Holy Spirit has here drawn to life all the griefs, sorrows, fears, doubts, hopes, cares, perplexities, in short, all the distracting emotions with which the minds of men are wont to be agitated. Uh, It's not uh, uncommon uh, that when we are uh, uh, about important work in the kingdom of God, that uh, the devil comes to us. And uh, we find ourselves ruminating on a difficulty in the church. We find ourselves uh, ruminating on uh, the uh, conversations that have been sharp that we've uh, recently had with an elder. We uh, find ourselves uh, thinking about uh, problems that have arisen with our children or uh, in our family life, and uh, we're distracted by these emotions. And uh, uh, all of life is uh, reflected in the Psalms in this ways: the griefs, the sorrows, the fears, the doubts, the hopes, the cares. Uh, Calvin is telling us; he's reminding us uh, that this is uh, the case. Uh, in short, Calvin says as calling upon God is one of the principal means of securing our safety, and as a better and more unerring rule for guiding us uh, in this exercise cannot be found elsewhere than in the Psalms. Uh, You see, I put this in italics purposely because it's such a strong statement. Uh, I I doubt that uh, men and women understand Uh, how important this is, uh, how significant this is, uh, that a more uh, unerring rule for guiding us in the exercise of calling upon God cannot be found elsewhere than in the Psalms. Uh, uh, This is an amazing statement, it seems. It follows, Calvin says, that in proportion to the proficiency which a man shall have attained in understanding them, Uh, That is, the more you ply the pages of the Psalms, the more you understand this uh, uh, penetrating subjectiveness, the more you uh, exercise your own heart in uh, uttering the words of the Psalter, uh, the better you will uh, have the knowledge of the most important part of celestial doctrine, uh, the better you'll understand God. Uh, uh, quite startling, uh, it seems to me, uh, is this statement. And uh, so uh, the Psalter is our guide for uh, calling out to God. Uh, Remember what we just read in uh, Psalm 130. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O oh Lord, who could stand? Uh, in uh, my homiletics classes, I encourage uh, men to uh, properly understand their text by imbibing the emotion 
of uh, the text. And uh, certainly this is what uh, we must do when we come to the Psalms. We must uh, imbibe the emotion uh, of the Psalter. And uh, uh, when we're caught in a particular circumstance and take the Psalms upon our lips, uh, the emotion expressed by the psalmist uh, becomes our emotion, or our emotion becomes the emotion expressed by the by the psalmist. This uh, is the subjective element, and uh, this is what Calvin is talking about as he's uh, speaking about the psalms being an unerring rule for guiding us in this exercise. Uh, Calvin's emphasis uh, on the subjective element in the Psalter, it appears, uh, I guess we can't uh, prove this uh, uh, infallibly, uh, but it appears that uh, Calvin's emphasis on the subjective element in the Psalter goes back to uh, Athanasius of Alexandria. And uh, so I'm, I'm going back to uh, Athanasius here and uh, his letter to Marcellinus concerning uh, the Psalms. And so this is our next step in uh, looking at some of these uh, quotes from uh, Athanasius. Uh, when we do this in class, uh, uh, most of the students are quite startled at uh, what Athanasius has to say. Uh, we're, we're getting the tip of the iceberg here. Uh, Athanasius says, among all the books, the Psalter has certainly a very special grace a choiceness of quality well worthy to be pondered. For besides the characteristics which it shares with others, uh, that is, it's uh, God's word to us, it has this peculiar marvel of its own, that within it are represented and portrayed in all their great variety the movements of the human soul. Uh, here's the anatomy of the soul again. Uh, uh, going back uh, uh, centuries to Athanasius. It is like a picture in which you see yourself portrayed, and seeing, many understand and consequently form, and seeing may consequently uh, form yourself upon the given, the pattern given. Uh, here you see yourself as in a mirror, and uh, this is a marvel, Athanasius says. As you see the various emotions uh, you have portrayed in the Psalter, and uh, you understand that this is the divine word of God, you can pattern yourself after how the psalmist expresses himself. Uh, you see, this is the subjective element again. And uh, this is why you would study anatomy and medicine, uh, because you want to find out how the body properly works. Well, in the same way, uh, you want to find out how uh, the soul is designed by God to cry out uh, to its maker. And uh, the Psalter, uh, it appears, is giving us the pattern uh, for doing such. Uh, so Athanasius uh, sets forth the subjective element. Uh, uh, he goes on to say, Elsewhere in the Bible you read only uh, that the law commands this or that to be done. And uh, uh, we're fine with this, aren't we? That uh, uh, the law uh, gives us direction uh, as uh, what to do and how to live. Uh, you listen to the prophets to learn about the Savior's coming. Or you turn to the historical books to learn the doings of the king and holy men. Uh, you see, again, here's the, uh, the Bible, the scriptures given to us as uh, God's word uh, to us. Uh, but Athanasius says, in the Psalter, besides all these things, you learn about yourself. Uh, now, I would say, oh, oh yes, you learn about yourself in other books of the Bible, in Ephesians 2, you learn about yourself as dead in sin. Uh, uh, objectively, you uh, learn doctrines uh, about yourself and about God. Uh, but the Psalter is, uh, is different. You find depicted in it all the movements of your soul. 
all its changes, its ups and downs, its failures and recoveries. Uh, you you look in in a proper sense. Uh, you you see this is not uh, improper introspection. Uh, we uh, we would uh, counsel against that, uh, but we we want to see the proper uh, carryings on in the soul and uh, what troubles uh, the soul. Moreover, whatever your particular need or trouble. Uh, from this same book, you can select uh, select a form of words to fit it, uh, so that you do not merely hear and then pass on, but learn the way to remedy your ill. You you learn subjectively uh, how you are to feel, how you are to express yourself. Uh, you see, again, this is the uh, subjective element. And uh, so, uh, Athanasius says, Moreover, whatever your particular need or trouble, from this same book, you can select a form of words to fit it. Uh, He gives it as an example, repentance. Repentance, for example, is enjoined repeatedly. But to repent means to leave off sinning. And it is in the Psalms, it is the Psalms that show you how to set about repenting and with what words your penitence may be expressed. Uh, You can think about David crying out in uh, Psalm 51. And uh, at one point he cries out to God, Oh God, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Uh, uh, David fears, uh, looking back at Saul, how uh, God removed uh, the kingship from Saul because of his sin, and uh, he removed the anointing of uh, Saul as king. And so David cries out, "Don't, don't let that happen to me!" And uh, 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 you can imagine uh, David's turmoil uh, in this circumstance. Again, St. Saint, Saint Paul says, Tribulation worketh endurance, and endurance experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. But it is in the Psalms that we find written and described how affliction sh- should be borne, and what the afflicted ought to say. O oh God, Psalm 42, why are you cast down, O my soul? Uh, the cry of the psalmist, hope in God, uh, turn your uh, uh, attention back uh, to God. Uh, I recall uh, working with a man who confessed he was in a deep clinical uh, depression, and uh, over a period of weeks and months, uh, just simply talking through the character of God, the sovereignty of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, uh, uh, this man came out of his uh, depression. And uh, uh, we see so much of this in the Psalter, how good God is. And uh, so we're given uh, what to say and uh, how we are to say it. Uh, uh, Athanasius continues, Or take the commandment, in everything give thanks. The Psalms not only exhort us to be thankful, they also provide us with fitting words to say. <laughs> uh, uh, just run through your mind some of the thanksgiving. Uh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. And uh, r- repeated and repeated the refrain is, uh, we are bidden elsewhere in the Bible also to bless the Lord and to acknowledge him. Here in the Psalms we are shown the way to do it, and with what sort of words his majesty may meetly be confessed. The Lord is king indeed. Let the peoples quail in fear. Oh, how the Psalms help us in the proper exercise of the, or the proper acknowledgement of, or the proper following of the commandments 
that uh, are given to us. In fact, under all the circumstances of life, we shall find that these divine songs suit ourselves and meet our own soul's need at every turn. And uh, so, again, uh, this is the subjective element. As uh, I've been in uh, the worship services uh, of our own uh, church and sung the psalms, I've had to uh, reflect on the fact that too often uh, I just sing. Uh, I don't pay attention to the words. I'm more caught up in the tune. And uh, I've had to force myself to look at the words and uh, consider the words and to consider what I'm saying uh, to God and about God. And uh, so uh, we must uh, act as we worship together. But the marvel uh, within the Psalter is that barring those prophecies about the Savior and some about the Gentiles, the reader takes all its words upon his lips as though they were his own. And each one sings the psalms as though they had been written for his special benefit and takes them and recites them, not as though someone else were speaking or another person's feelings were being described, but as himself speaking of himself, offering the words to God as his own heart's utterance, just as though he himself had made them up. Oh, and of course he didn't make them up. But uh, when you read the Psalms, is this not the case? And uh, when you find yourself in a difficulty and you go to the Psalter uh, to find comfort and solace and, uh, and consolation, don't you take the words of the Psalms on your own lips and in your own heart as your words? Uh, you see, this is this is what uh, uh, Athanasius is uh, talking about. Uh, Gerhardus Voss preached a sermon at Princeton Seminary Chapel on October 15, 1902, based on Psalm 25:4. Uh, the sermon is titled "Songs from the Soul," uh, and you can tell from the title that uh, Voss is interested in talking about this subjective element. Uh, the text reads. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Uh, Interestingly enough, when we first uh, look at this text, uh, we we think of it as God's word to us. And uh, we uh, think about God uh, uh, making us know his ways objectively. And... uh, uh, teaching us to walk in his paths in, a, in an objective fashion. Uh, but this is not what Voss is really after. Uh, he, he's after the uh, subjective. He's after our knowing the ways of God uh, in our hearts, of letting the word of Christ dwell within our hearts richly, and of uh, having proper feelings and emotions Uh, that exude from our lives. Uh, Voss begins his sermon uh, with these stunning words, and uh, I purposely use this adjective, stunning. Uh, The Psalter is of all books of the Bible, that book which gives expression to the experimental side of religion. Uh, I think often we are uh, anxious to think about the objective side of religion. And uh, we're not as uh, tuned in to the experimental side. Uh, But Voss says, hence the Psalter has been at all times that part of Scripture to which believers have most readily turned and upon which they have chiefly depended for nourishment of the inner religious life of the heart. And isn't this the case? Isn't this why the Psalter uh, for centuries and for millennia uh, has been uh, the book to which uh, individuals turn? Uh, Still in the first paragraph of his manuscript, Voss says, Our Lord himself, who had a perfect religious experience, 
and uh, who would doubt that this is the case? Our Lord himself, who had a perfect religious experience, found his inner life portrayed in the Psalter and in some of the highest moments of his ministry, borrowed from it the language in which his soul spoke to God. Thus recognizing that a more perfect language for communion with God cannot be framed. It's that final clause that uh, seems to me to be so stunning. Uh, And, uh, of course, Calvin uh, put it in uh, similar words. Uh, As I say here, this is stunning. Uh, A language more perfect than the Psalms for communion with God cannot be framed? Uh, we, we can put that in the form of a question. Uh, how can this be? Uh, it, it's because the Psalter is inspired language. It is language breathed out by God. It is language given to us by the Holy Spirit. It is language given to us for the expression of our own hearts and souls. This is uh, the genius of the Psalter, it seems to me. Here, says Voss, the language of the Bible comes to meet the very thoughts of our own hearts before these can be can even clothe themselves in language uh, uh, w- w- we have feelings that we yearn to express we go to the psalter and uh, what do we find the means of expressing uh, those feelings before uh, those emotions before the uh, sense of thought within our hearts uh, before we can clothe them in language ourselves, as Voss says, and we recognize that we could not have expressed them better than the Spirit has here expressed them for us. Uh, And here uh, is one of the things that we should take away from all of this. The language of the Psalms is therefore useful and suitable and functional for all peoples in all times. See, all the objections that are raised against psalmody, uh, I think, fall away when we properly understand this subjective element that God has been pleased to give to us a guide for the expression of our own feelings and emotions and The language of the Psalms, as I say here, is useful and suitable and functional then for all peoples in all times. Uh, You you see, uh, uh, I think uh, we need to desperately capture this stunning perspective, and uh, I, uh, I purposely use, again, this adjective a language more perfect than the Psalms for communion with God cannot be framed. Uh, Perhaps some uh, draw back uh, from this, Uh, but how can we in the end? Uh, Because this is language breathed out by God, and it is language given to us for the expression of our own hearts and souls. And uh, so uh, this, friends, is the subjective element. Voss reminds us that because of the subjective element, the language of the Psalter is useful and suitable and functional for all peoples in all times. Uh, I've just gone through a study myself on uh, psalmody and uh, been doing some writing, and uh, a part of the study has uh, involved objections to psalmody. And one of the threads that runs through the objections to psalmody is a lack of perspective with regard to this subjective element, uh, a principal function of the psalms. And uh, so, uh, as I say here, the language of the Psalter in giving expression to the soul is universal. Uh, This is what Uh, comes out of a study like this. The language of the Psalter in giving expression to the feelings and emotions is transgenerational 
and cross-cultural. It's not uh, reserved for one generation. It's not reserved for one culture. Uh, The Psalter is given to us as a means for the expression of our hearts uh, to God uh, for all peoples in all times, in all cultures. And uh, this is the beauty uh, of the Psalter. Uh, As uh, Voss says, at first sight, this may easily seem strange to us when we remember that the psalmist lived under conditions of a typical and preparatory dispensation that on many points they saw through a glass darkly, whereas we who live in the full light of the complete gospel see face to face. But for the very reason that the Psalms reflect the experimental religion of the heart, which is unvarying at all times and under all circumstances, we need not wonder at this. Uh, Why is the Psalter suitable for all generations, for all times, for all cultures, uh, because it reflects the experimental religion of the heart. Uh, that's the reason. Uh, it, it gives us uh, the divine perspective on the heart and guides us in the expression of the heart's uh, deepest longings Uh, This, again, is the subjective element. As just observed, we see the subjective element in Paul as he advocates psalmody early in the 60s. Athanasius carried the subjective element forward in his teaching psalmody, 350 A.D. Calvin, 1543, likely derived his understanding of the subjective element from Athanasius. And he, too, advocated psalmody. Finally, we see the subjective element in Gerhardus Voss. We, too, and uh, I I think this is the case, we, too, must key in on this subjective element to appreciate the psalms and psalmody. Uh, Michael Lefebvre has asked the question about uh, the psalms posed And uh, the question is posed by Bonhoeffer. How did these words which men sang to God come to be regarded as words from God to man? That is, if the psalms were composed for worshipers to lift their thoughts by singing up to God, why do we study them by reading as thoughts from God down to us? Why the shift? Why the change? Why the difference in perspective. Uh, The uh, answer to uh, Bonhoeffer's question, I think, is critical. It's crucial. And it seems to me that the answer to the question is, we've dropped the subjective element. Uh, In the words of Lefebvre, we've stopped using the Psalms as human words to God. We've stopped taking the Psalms on our lips as our words given to us by God to pray to God, to sing back to God. We've dropped the subjective element. And uh, so my encouragement uh, for us in in this uh, webinar is to take a few steps back and think through uh, the subjective element in the Psalter and understand that This really is the genius of the Psalms. As I say here, this brings us full circle in our discussion. What is this subjective element? As Voss states in his Eschatology of the Psalter, the deeper fundamental character of the Psalter consists in this, that it voices the subjective response to the objective doings of God for and among his people. Subjective responsiveness is the specific quality of these songs. The Psalms, therefore, present us a divine guide for our subjective responsiveness to God. The Psalms give us a divine guide 
for the expression of all our emotions. Uh, this, friends, is the subjective element. And as Voss says, again, in his sermon entitled Songs of the Soul, a more perfect language for communion with God cannot be framed. There we have it. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to fire them my way. All right, the first of the questions are being compiled, so uh, while that's happening, uh, let me uh, just uh, tell you a couple of things about our speaker today. Uh, in case you didn't know it, Dr. Proto uh, is uh, very popular on Sermon Audio with over 205,000 downloads at this point. Uh, and then uh, this coming summer, he's going to be quite busy with a variety of speaking Engagements. He'll be at the Banner Truth Conference uh, uh, toward the end of May with some interesting topics around the meat and potatoes of sermon preparation and uh, the preaching moment, uh, feeding your people. And then uh, we also have uh, something on the Westminster Conference coming up. Uh, that'll be the end of June here at RPTS. The topic of that conference is the uh, larger catechism, and uh, particularly the commandments, and Dr. Perteau will be addressing purity in worship, which of course uh, would lead us to the second commandment. Uh, while we're, we do have one question, and uh, my printer is not working, so I'm having problems getting that question to him. Uh, I will take you for a second to uh, what we have coming up next in terms of webinars, and you can take a look there. And we're uh, working on the fly here. Uh, but uh, next month, uh, March 1st, uh, Pastor Pete Smith, uh, he's a Covenant Fellowship here in Pittsburgh, and he'll be speaking with us on uh, Ministry to the Poor, and then uh, in April, uh, we will have uh, Professor C.J. Williams. He will be speaking on the exegetical consideration of creationism. And uh, he'll be doing that from the original Hebrew language. And, of course, Dr. Proutot is our Hebrew uh, specialist. All of those webinars begin at 3 o'clock Eastern Time. <laughs> yes, that's right. And uh, while we finish up with some additional questions here, you will see uh, this list of primary resources that Dr. Proutot used, and uh, you can glance at those. We'll have this available on the web also for you, you to be able to listen to later and look at later. So we've got the first question coming up here. And uh, Dr. Perto will answer that. Okay, the uh, first uh, question or the question we have is uh, why uh, does uh, teaching and admonishing in uh, Colossians 3.16 uh, refer to preaching? And uh, I think the best way to understand this is uh, uh, with the reference in uh, Colossians 1.28. Uh, and if you look at Colossians 1.28, uh, uh, Paul says, uh, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. And uh, if you look at the uh, original language especially, uh, it's the same words that uh, Paul uses in Colossians uh, 3.16. And uh, here in Colossians 1.28, he's uh, describing uh, the preaching that he does. And uh, so uh, 
Uh, I think this is a, a good uh, verification of the fact that uh, uh, teaching and admonishing or warning and uh, teaching uh, with all wisdom is uh, actually preaching. And uh, the other thing is, uh, I think we have to remember that the uh, letter to the Colossians uh, was not received uh, by the people uh, in the church at Colossae uh, in written uh, form. That is, they didn't uh, each uh, one individually receive a letter. Uh, They didn't uh, look at an email. They didn't uh, look on Twitter or Facebook. Uh, Rather, they were uh, sitting together in sacred assembly and uh, listening to uh, this uh, letter read to them. And uh, so this was a corporate situation in which they found themselves. And uh, I think we miss this quite often when we are uh, uh, looking at uh, Colossians 3.16, that it's really the corporate situation that uh, w- we need to be concerned with. Uh, here's another question. Do you have any practical advice for learning how to take up the Psalms for ourselves in, in this subjective way? Uh, well, uh, I think uh, what what you need to do, what we all need to do, is uh, uh, start thinking about the Psalms in this way and uh, praying uh, the psalms, utilizing the psalms uh, as our own prayers, and uh, looking to God uh, through the words of the psalm, and uh, uh, just practicing this, uh, 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 learning to do it ourselves. Uh, the only way this can can be done is uh, by uh, uh, setting aside some time and actually uh, carrying it out. Uh, uh, I recall uh, in high school particularly uh, being on the uh, football field and, uh, uh, of course, uh, the coach is giving a demonstration on on how to block, uh, but uh, what do you have to do? You have to get out there and do it yourself. You have to be uh, personally engaged in the activity to uh, learn how uh, to do it and to uh, practice it. And I, I think it's the same thing as far as the Psalms are concerned, uh, to uh, 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 just think about uh, when you read the Psalms of uh, taking these Psalms upon your own heart and lips and uh, speaking them to God uh, as your prayers. And uh, I think this is what uh, Calvin uh, would encourage. This is what Athanasius uh, would have encouraged in those uh, early centuries And it seems to me that that's what uh, Voss uh, is talking about in this uh, subjective element. Okay, we have one more coming. The the technology guru is uh, working on this. So uh, stand by. He's running out to the hallway now to uh, the printer. He's returning from the printer. If the Psalms give us a divine guide, why can't we use it as a guide for composing more songs from our heart? Well, my my first response to this is that uh, we are not organs of special revelation. Uh, that that's my first and immediate uh, response uh, to the question. And uh, uh, I suppose my second r- response would be that, and uh, uh, I'm leaning on another author here. Uh, I'd have to go, uh, look up the reference. Uh, but uh, uh, th- this particular fellow uh, says uh, uh, we need to be reminded of the fact that uh, we're sinful vessels, that uh, we are uh, subject to all of the uh, 
uh, negative aspects of the fall. Even though redeemed, uh, sin drags on us uh, heavily. And uh, we ought not to expect that we can do better than the inspired uh, writers. And uh, I agree with that. Uh, I think we ought to uh, lean uh, heavily on the inspired writers and on uh, what they have to say. Uh, And so that ought to be our first uh, inclination uh, rather than uh, uh, moving toward uh, the composition of other uh, songs. Uh, uh, Here is another question. How do opponents of psalmody argue against the point that a language more perfect than the psalms for communion with God cannot be framed? Uh, This is an interesting question because as I've reviewed uh, in my recent study the objections raised against uh, psalmody, no one has uh, spoken to this subjective element and uh, the fact that Uh, a a better language uh, cannot be framed. Uh, They ignore this whole idea entirely. Uh, So uh, I I guess the bottom line is I can't answer that question because I haven't seen it. I haven't seen anyone argue uh, against this. And uh, perhaps I will, uh, and uh, perhaps those of you who are listening will uh, uh, be able uh, to direct me Uh, to those that uh, do argue uh, uh, in in this way, but uh, I haven't seen any arguments that uh, uh, are are mounted against this uh, subjective element and uh, this uh, language framed uh, the way it is in the Psalter. Okay, friends, I uh, am grateful for your attention and uh, uh, we're thankful for uh, you're being with us. We're thankful for RP Missions and uh, its uh, uh, sponsorship of the uh, uh, webinar. And uh, we trust that the Lord will bless you. And uh, we say uh, goodbye.